So, well, thank you again, um, Lieutenant Governor Evett, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking time uh, and being part of this uh, part of this um, call. We are doing a series called uh, Greer Chamber Live, and um, what we're doing is reaching out to uh, individuals in our community and the state. Um, and hopefully in the, on a national level as well, just to talk to us about things that are happening with um, COVID-19, but also things that are happening that we uh, need to pay attention to. So uh, with that, I'm just gonna, most everyone in this room, I believe, um, I know who you are, a lot of these, a lot of those that have signed up have um, heard you speak and uh, especially at our first Friday event, um, but I'm going to turn it over to you. And again, we are recording this. Also, those that are in attendance today, feel free to, Go down to the chat section. If you go to two and you find David Merhib, send me a, um, a message. If you'd like to have a question read that isn't uh, that isn't read, you can just send that privately to me, and I'll make sure I get that uh, passed along. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Greer Chamber for putting this together. I know this is a very um, trying time for businesses as we kind of go through this COVID-19 pandemic together. Uh, I was given a list of questions um, and I'm gonna go through those with some answers, but I wanna kick it off um, by talking about a website that I worked on with the Department of Commerce. You know, the governor uh, was very uh, insistent on taking care of business and having businesses know that we, um, we are in it with them and we feel, um, we feel your pain and we want to be here shoulder to shoulder with you. And so uh, I worked with Commerce based on his guidelines and what he wanted to see accomplished. And we put together uh, a site on Commerce. Uh, you can access, access that site by going to www.sccommerce.com. Uh, right when you log on, you'll see an orange box in the center and it will say COVID-19 Resource Center and uh, just hit the button. And what we've accomplished there, which I think is really important, is we have brought all the data that we believe business will need into one place. Uh, you know, we know, and being a business owner myself, sometimes it gets very confusing going from website to website or trying to figure out where to navigate and find the information that we need. So by putting everything in one place, we're hoping it'll take some stress off of trying to find answers to questions. One thing that we were all very insistent on is making sure that it was in very plain, a uh, clear language that will um, uh, that would make it easy for business owners to be able to decipher when trying to get their questions asked. So that was our directive to every one of our uh, departments, whether it be revenue or unemployment. Uh, we worked really hard on getting all the SBA loan information and the payroll protection information and all the things that came out with the CARE Act. So we're making sure we keep that site updated uh, with the most current information. We've added the governor's executive orders there and um, we also put his latest one uh, with businesses that he felt were non-essential and that needed to be closed down uh, under his directive. That is on there. Uh, so we, we are getting great feedback from businesses thinking that it's a great resource and a great tool. So as I go through these questions, uh, if there's something you miss, almost every one of the questions that was given to me by the Greer Chamber uh, is on that website. The answer to it is on there. So use that as a resource. Again, that's www.sccommerce.com. So the first question that I was asked said, I heard a rumor that the PPP loans are only forgivable up to 25%. In other words, if the loan is for 10,000, only 2,500 would be forgiven and the other 7,500 would need to be repaid. Um, so loan amounts will be forgiven. Uh, you will owe money when your loan is due if you use the loan amount for anything other than payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, utility payments, um, over the eight weeks after getting the loan. So you want to focus on what you're using those monies for. Due to likely high subscriptions, it's anticipated that not more than 25% of the forgiven amount may be for non-payroll costs. Uh, you will also owe money if you do not maintain your staff and payroll. 
So kind of in a plain English summary, um, your loan forgiveness will be reduced if you decrease your full-time employee headcount. Uh, your loan forgiveness may also be reduced if you decrease salaries and wages by more than 25% for any of your employees that made less than $100,000 in 2019. But you have a way to make this up. So if you had to do this because uh, you needed to close down uh, due to COVID-19, there is a rehiring provision. So you have until June 30th of 2020 to restore your full-time employment and the salary levels for any changes that were made between February 15th and April 26th. So there is room there. So don't panic if you had uh, to lay off employees and now you're thinking, oh no, I have just made myself ineligible forgiveness for the PPP loan. There is an, an adjuster to bring you back. So I think that's really important. I think that's where people are getting confused a lot. Uh, so the second question was, I heard that there are $10,000 grants out there available to small businesses. Is there any truth to this? That is true. Um, there is an, an SBA advance uh, for disaster loans. So uh, the expanded US SBA economic injury loan uh, program uh, it was expanded under the CARES Act that was passed on Friday. Uh, it introduced an expansion to the EDIL program. The goal of that expansion uh, is to offer financial support to more businesses experiencing uh, revenue decreases due to the pandemic. Uh, so historically, the SBA has offered disaster relief assistance to businesses, homeowners and renters during a time of disaster. Um, normally, the states would have to apply for that disaster and you'd have to show uh, the economic effect on your state. Right now, it's opened up to all states, our territories, and uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, to receive a $10,000 loan advance. Uh, the EDIL program, that's the Disaster Loan Program, uh, provides working capital to small businesses uh, with low interest loans. Uh, up to $2 million. So now that's for the EDIL loans. Uh, they have a $2 million cap. If you're a for-profit business, uh, the interest rates uh, are 3.75%, while nonprofits will pay 2.75%. So profits are 3.75, nonprofits are 2.75. Um, and you can receive the $10,000 advance on those disaster loans. Uh, the EDIL program provides working capital to small businesses. That's the whole purpose via low interest rate loans. And um, they can last up to 30 years case by case. So there are some uh, fluctuations within the term. You can apply online for the EDIL loans and the $10,000 advance. Uh, and they've, simpli they've simplified this application process uh, I know a lot of guidance is coming out today. I've heard from a lot of small businesses that they have had their paperwork ready to submit today for um, a lot of the, the, payroll, um, the payroll loan forgiveness as well as the disaster loans. Uh, so number three, if we were to lay off employees now until we were able to get funds from the SBA loan, and then brought them back as soon as those funds were available, could we still qualify for the forgiven portion? I heard that you need to help employees, uh, I heard that you need to keep employees whole, but you could cure if you were already, if you had already laid them off. And I think we kind of discussed that in the first question. Yes, if you've had to lay employees off, um, and now we came out with the CARES Act and the, the payroll protection loans, you can. Again, that's that um, June 30th deadline. You want to make sure that you, you're bringing your employees back and you're making them whole by June 30th. So question number four was, can you tell us more about what the benefits in the CARES Act mean for businesses on every level as well as individuals? So this is kind of long and this is where I encourage you all to go to the website that I talked about through Commerce. Uh, because there's a lot of pieces and I'm going to try to hit all the highlights. Um, but 
if you need to, again, go back to that website. Most of these things, really all of them are outlined there. Uh, so the CARES Act, as you can imagine, is an enormous piece of legislation. Uh, and some parts of it, we're still waiting for guidance on. So um, we have the Paycheck Protection Act, which we already discussed. Um, that's gonna be a great tool. I think employers are very excited about uh, that piece of it. Unemployment assistance, uh, people who are unemployed will get an extra $600 per week for up to four months on top of the state unemployment benefits uh, to make up 100% of their lost wages. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions as has Director Elsby from businesses wanting to know like, uh, well, what will happen when we start calling people back to work and they don't wanna lose uh, the extra amount of money that comes uh, from their unemployment? Well, it, it's just like it is in any other time. When you call people back to work, if they don't come, they will lose benefits and the, the due will be giving out guidance to that uh, as we get closer to ending this pandemic. Stimulus checks. Uh, all U.S. residents with adjusted gross income uh, up to $75,000, $150,000 for married couples, will get a $1,200 rebate payment. $1,200 per individual, $2,400 uh, per couple, uh, they are also eligible for an additional $500 per child. Uh, the payments will start phasing out uh, for, er for people who have earned above those threshold limits. Um, single filers earning more than $99,000, uh, head of household filers with one child um, more than $146,500, and more than 198,000 for our joint filers with no children. So those are the phase out amounts. Uh, there's unemployment assistance for gig workers and freelance workers. So our self-employed have some recourse within the CARES Act. Uh, SBA loans. Uh, they have uh, allocated $350 billion for Small Business Administration to provide loans. Uh, during, uh, under the SBA program of up to $10, $10 million per business. So that's the max per business under SBA. And I know, I don't feel like this is like, wow, there are so many limits. There are limits and those limits are different based on um, what loan you're actually looking at. So keep that in mind. I know people are getting confused by the different loan limits they hear. Uh, healthcare providers uh, under this act will secure $100 billion in grants uh, for their fight against the coronavirus to make up for the dollars they've lost um, due to delaying elective surgeries. Um, they will also get a 20% bump in their Medicare, Medicare payments for treatment of patients that have the virus. Uh, 15.5 billion is going to a supplemental nutrition program, our food stamp program, um, also known as SNAP. Uh, monies will cover the expected cost of new applicants that will be applying due to loss of employment as a result of the coronavirus. State and local governments, uh, a bill provides $150 billion for state and local governments with an $8 billion set aside for local governments. Uh, uh, South Carolina will receive about $1.9 billion of this money. Uh, at the end of this, I'm going to talk about how some of that is determined and why what we're in the middle of right now, the census, is so important and why I need everybody's help um, here in the upstate and across the state to make sure that we're filing those numbers. So I'm going to come back to how some of those allocations are done. Student loan payments. I know we hear a lot about student loans. Um, so the Department of Education will suspend payments uh, on student loans to their borrowers until September 30th. Uh, Real ID deadlines have been extended. Uh, so they will be extended to September of 2021. Foreclosures and evictions. Now this is a big one I know people are talking about. Um, the bill states that facing financial hardship from the coronavirus that any federally backed mortgages will, um, 
will uh, be extended by 60 days. So any eviction and foreclosure uh, processes have to be extended by 60 days. Um, the legislation says servicers of federally backed mortgage loans may not begin the foreclosure process for 60 days from March 18th. The bill also does not allow fees, penalties, additional interest to be charged during this payment delay. So that's 60 days. It includes similar protections for multifamily federal mortgage loans, allowing to, they are allowed to receive a 30 day forbearance for up to two and up to two 30 day extensions. Uh, the, this bill, the CARES bill provides for food assistance also. So the bill provides $450 million for emergency food assistance uh, to supply our food banks, uh, which are expected to see a lot more clients uh, due to job loss. Uh, some 350 million will buy additional food and 100 million would be used for distribution. The package also provides 200 million for food assistance for Puerto Rico, US territories, as well as 100 million for food distribution to American Indian reservations. Uh, it provides additional funding for supplemental nutrition assistance programs, our SNAP programs, and child nutrition programs, which would not be eligible currently under the benefit. So that is, is a lot of information of what was covered in the CARES Act. Uh, so we have question now number five, what are the first steps someone who has been laid off or furloughed need to take? So. Um, if you have been laid off or furloughed due to the corona, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the first thing you need to do is submit your paperwork uh, to the Department of Workforce due. Uh, they, have, they are working really around the clock. Uh, all submissions can be done online. If you have special questions, please call the office. Um, employees and employers, you can go on to the website through Commerce that I talked about, there's a link there. Do has done a great job of putting the most frequently asked questions and the answers to those questions on that page. Uh, so if you're becoming frustrated because you're on hold or there's a uh, long wait times, you may have your question answered there. Uh, we're trying to push people in that direction to uh, keep their call lines low. So where they're just having to talk to people that have really niche questions. So uh, again, go out to that website. Uh, the governor has made it very clear uh, in his executive orders that he's doing everything he can to take care of businesses and workers. So we have, do has waived the uh, week wait time. So employees that have had to be laid off due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic will get their checks a week earlier than they normally would. They have also waived um, the directive to have to go on and apply to two, uh, uh, apply for two jobs per week because obviously in this time um, that's that's not something they're going to do. On a bright side with due, uh, they are still employers looking for employees and so due is doing everything they can to um, match employees that are expressing a willingness to want to get back to work and want to work somewhere. Um, they're trying to match them to jobs that we still have open and available here in South Carolina. So they're, they're definitely multitasking on that end. Um, make sure I'm hitting all the highlights. So uh, people that need to get in contact with do, uh, you can go to do.sc.gov forward slash contacts. Uh, and communicate directly with the, uh, with the agency. That's do.sc.gov forward slash contacts. Um, to the business owners that are out there listening, uh, I was getting a lot of questions early on, uh, is how is this gonna affect my mod rate at the end of the year when I have to lay off? This will not have an adverse effect on your mod rate. So we don't want you to have to worry about that. Uh, because the governor has declared, declared a state of emergency, um, any layoffs due to the COVID-19 pandemic will not have an adverse effect on you, which I know is something we all, we all worry about. Um, and then question number six. 
Am I eligible for unemployment if my hours have been reduced? Uh, yes, unemployment benefits are available to any individual uh, who is em unemployed through no fault of his or her own. If an employer reduces hours to an employee's work, individuals may be eligible for unemployment benefits. Uh, again, there's a calculation that do will do to see exactly how much supplement you will get from unemployment if your hours have just been reduced. Um, one thing I guess I want to add that I didn't include in these responses is make sure that, you know, everybody is noting that they are laid off. If they're being laid off due to COVID-19, um, it's a different set of rules that are being used than if they're just laid off because you know they are not showing up to work or um, something has happened during a normal course of employment that is you terminated for any other reason but COVID-19. So we want to make sure that when unemployment notices are being filled out that we are specifying if the loss was due to COVID-19. Number seven, what are the first steps a business needs to take? needs to take to take to take advantage of benefit from the cares act so um one of the biggest lifelines like we talked about is the paycheck protection program uh it consists of 350 billion dollars in government backed loans uh to help maintain payroll uh, that is a huge lifeline the first thing to do would be to uh, contact a uh, a business borrower needs to contact and go online to get all the important um, loan application and get that filled out. Uh, the Small Business Disaster Loan Recovery was also introduced. Again, uh, a lot of the paperwork is online. You can start by filling that out. There's information you have to gather. So you wanna make sure you do that. I know a lot of business owners have been working uh, all week trying to get their paperwork together for submissions today. Uh, if you haven't done that, if you didn't realize submissions were today, do not panic. Let's see. So one thing under the CARES Act that we need to talk about is we updated the updated business tax provisions. So the CARES Act makes changes to some tax, poli tax policies affecting small businesses. Um, and I want to talk about those. We have the employee retention credit. So employers whose operations were fully or partially suspended due to a shutdown um, or their receipts declined more than 50%. So if you didn't completely shut down, but your receipts, uh, your revenues declined more than 50% compared to the same quarter a year ago, you may be eligible for this refundable tax credit the 50% tax credit up, uh, applies to wages paid to workers during the pandemic. So up to $10,000 is available in this tax credit uh, and it's available for wages paid from March 13th through December 31st. So it's not a loan under the CARES Act, but it's a tax credit. So something you wanna keep in mind, consult with your accountants at the end of the year when you're doing your tax filings. So the other thing that came about was deferring the tax, deferring employer payroll taxes. So employers uh, who do not receive forgiveness for the payroll protection program loan can delay the payment of their payroll taxes. Uh, this covers the employer's share of social security, the employer's share, okay? Uh, not the ones that you're holding in trust for the employee. Those who are self-employed can defer the payment of the employer's share also. The deferred tax payments may be paid back over a two-year period. So you'll have two years to pay that back, uh, half by December 31st of 2021, and the other half by December 31st, 2022. Uh, as a side note, uh, I'm sure everybody knows that Income taxes and corporate taxes have been uh, deferred to July 15th. Uh, we have also matched that for state taxes on corporate and individual income taxes uh, to match the federal guidelines. 
Uh, the Department of Revenue, by guidance of the governor, has also pushed back other state taxes to June 1st. So that sales tax, use tax, uh, uh, liquor tax, property taxes that the state collects, not the city. That's like the P100 forms. Um, so take a look. Again, go out to the Commerce website, look under revenue. It's listed out for you. Um, they do a great job of distinguishing between our corporate taxes and other taxes that are collected here in our state. We also have the federal guidelines of those taxes and the dates that they're pushed back to on that website. Does the governor have any additional plans? This is, I'm sorry, question number eight. Does the governor have any additional plans to reduce the spread of COVID-19? Um, so you hear the governor has done a great job of trying to Pamela, you are, you're muted and I can't unmute you. I don't know what happened. Okay. It's kind of muted, but <laughs> I'm going to go back. Did you guys hear me read question number eight? No. Okay. No, you were, you were muted right after you read the question. Okay, great. Okay. So thank the, you. No, thank you. Does the governor plan, have any other plans to reduce the spread? So we know the number one way to reduce the spread is to keep our distance. Social distancing is so important uh, and we can't stress that enough. We've seen that across the country. We've been hearing that um, from the uh, experts on a federal level and a state level. Staying apart, um, making sure we do our, our, our best, you know, to help our neighbors by staying away from our neighbors is the best thing we can all do. Uh, as the governor has said, uh, everything is on the table and nothing is off the table but he's making um, decisions based on the data we're given. Every day uh, we get together through SCEMD and have um, calls with uh, all of our cabinet directors so that we're, we all have the latest information from DHEC, um, from SLED, from DNR, from um, all of our agencies. Unemployment, we get updates every day, Department of Revenue. So the governor is taking information, current, accurate information in making his decisions on how to move the state forward during this um, unprecedented time. So uh, like he said, I, I can't emphasize enough, everything is on the table. And when he feels uh, the time has come to um, make another executive order or move on, he will. But in the meantime, uh, he just cannot stress enough the social distancing aspect of this as we're, as we're hearing from everybody. Social distancing is the best thing we can all do. Uh, number nine, are, are we as a state equipped with supplies to handle a widespread COVID-19 outbreak like New York is facing? Um, currently, we are not facing a shortage of anything. So the governor uh, asked very early our healthcare systems to stop elective surgeries. Uh, and they did, that was to save vital PPE, uh, which has happened. Uh, and so we are in good shape. Uh, as of right now, we feel very good about where we are and what we've done to get us to this point. Um, as long as people stay home and we keep continuing to flatten the curve here in South Carolina, uh, I believe we'll be fine. Uh, but again, this is not something we take lightly and it's something that's being monitored every single day. And then question number 10, how has COVID-19 impacted our import export business uh, and how has tourism been impacted? Um, so I, I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody that our tourism um, economy has been really hit hard. Uh, Ori County, um, Myrtle Beach has asked hotels and campgrounds and VBROs to close and they have. Um, you know, restaurants are now down to takeout. Uh, we don't have any idea uh, ex right now the full uh, impact that we have taken. Uh, we are trying to remain optimistic as our, uh, our hotel owners and 
uh, everybody uh, that deals in tourism here in South Carolina, that if everybody does their part and we flatten this curve, we can come out of this and you know we still have a summer to uh, bounce back from. So we want to do everything we can to help those businesses. But yes, we have been we have been impacted greatly. Uh, as far as our ports, our ports were doing great uh, up until this. As most of you know, BMW has taken a two-week furlough. Uh, you know, BMW uh, is is a huge producer here in South Carolina when it relates to our ports. We export more complete. Uh, completed cars than anybody in the country. Um, so that is slowing down right now. But again, uh, you know, as the governor says, if we all do our part uh, and we keep this, um, we keep the curve flat, it'll be the quicker we can get our economy up and going, get everybody back to work um, and do the right thing by South Carolina. So we have been impacted, but we're a very resilient state. And as the governor says, what sets us apart as us, the people. And so the more we do to help each other, uh, the more we do to, to listen and follow directive, the better off we're gonna be at the end of the day. So with that, that was my, the 10 questions that had been given to me. Um, one thing I wanna add before we take questions from the people who are on the Zoom call is April 1st, we kicked off the 2020 Complete Count Census. And I know right now people are thinking, oh, I don't know that this is the least of my worries. This should be top on our list to do. Uh, it's, it's so easy. This is the first time ever that we have been able to um, do this online. So you can do it from your phone, your iPad, your computer. Uh, this is how we get money from the federal government as a state. So there's all different levels of money that you see go out from the federal government. But as an average, there's $657 billion that the federal government will trickle down to the states. Uh, it is all based, our portion of what we get here in South Carolina is based on those census numbers. And so people will say to me, Lieutenant Governor, why is it so, why is it so important? Why are you pushing this so hard? Well, the money that we'll be getting from the federal government today for the COVID-19 pandemic is based on numbers that were calculated in the 2010 census. And what most people don't know is that uh, on the low side, we were at least 20% undercounted. So 20% of the money that should be coming to us, we won't be getting um, because we didn't have people file the census. So we're all business people. We all understand how important it is to get our fair share. Every time I travel around the state and I talk to chambers, just like Greer Chamber, what do we hear about? Our roads, right? We're not getting them done fast enough. How do we get more funds? How do we get our roads, our bridges, our infrastructure? We get it from the gas tax, but we also get it from the federal government. And it's based on census numbers. So when you think about all the things we need here to run as a state, census becomes very important. So again, if you go on to www, Dot census gov. I did it for my household just a few days ago, and it literally took me less than five minutes. They're not asking you for a social security number. They're not asking you for anything that you have to worry about. Uh, I'm trying to uh, get out all the, all the obstacles people throw at me to why they don't want to do it. One of them is, what are they going to do with my data? I don't like that I'm submitting data that anybody can use. I know we all hear that. By law, uh, they can't use this data for 72 years. It's locked up for 72 years. And if a census worker uh, would be caught giving away anybody's data, uh, the, the, um, the penalty for that are fines and imprisonment. So that's how important we looked at census data way back when this was created. So uh, everybody, please do your part. Uh, I've been, I was on April 1st on, with all of our media partners across the state uh, talking about it and the importance of it. Uh, as of yesterday, we only were 34% submitted in South Carolina. We're not at the bottom of the list, but we are, we're, we're pretty close. And this is something we should be top of the list on. With the way South Carolina is growing uh, and the needs and necessities that we have here in this state, um, let's be number one. Let's be a, a, the state that gets 100% participation. And by doing that, please reach out to 10 people and make sure they've done their census. Please reach out to our elderly community. 
Um, you know, they get nervous when they see forms that they don't normally see in the mail. Uh, help them, help walk, walk our parents and grandparents through these things. Um, you can help them online, it's very secure. They don't even have to go out to the post office to get a stamp. So I can't stress uh, the importance of the census enough. So if you'll all help me do our part, that would be so, so much appreciated. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you if you have any other questions that have come up that I can help answer. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much. And um, we do have one, we had three questions total. You answered two of them uh, during your talk. So one last one, it says, do we, uh, do we yet know or do we know yet what the all clear looks like? And once we get an all clear, how will we start restarting businesses that are asked to close or that so, were asked to close? Yeah, so we are, you know, like everybody else, we're, we're being cautiously optimistic. We're preparing for the worst. We're praying for the best. Um, we're not, we don't have an all clear date as of right now, but what we will be doing is putting together a group uh, of business owners and financial experts to help us, you know, jumpstart once we once we see that we can turn back the uh, open for business sign on uh, to help us uh, look at how we do that in the best way for our businesses. So we'll like we do all the time, try to bring the best and brightest to the table and do public private partnerships to make sure we get input from everybody. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I do want to, I have a request from our uh, board chairman, uh, Brett Garrett. I'm going to unmute him right now. Oops, Brent, you're going to have to unmute on your, your side. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Lieutenant Governor Evett, we just want to thank you for being here um, or being uh, with us on Zoom. Um, I do have one question to ask. Does, how does the census affect uh, education? and teacher pay and funding for the state? So it does affect education because we do get dollars from the federal government uh, to that. Uh, education is something we've been working on a lot, obviously in Columbia, the governor said it in his state of the state last year, uh, is that it was the time to be bold. And so we took bold steps. Uh, we did teacher pay increases last year. Uh, the governor's asked for additional teacher pay increases this year from the state. Uh, this will take us up considerably. Uh, it'll take us to the middle of the pack in what our teachers are being paid. And so we feel that is the best way to uh, retain the best and brightest uh, here in our state. Uh, one thing I think I shared when I was with the Greer Chamber is that, you know, we're 50th uh, in where we stand in, in education, but we're 25th in the country of what we give to uh, per student across the state for education. So 25th of what we're putting in and 50th an outcome. So we see Brett, it doesn't, it's not all money. A lot of it has to do with reform and that's what the governor and Speaker Lucas were really pushing for in this education reform bill um, is to have true reform and uh, keeping, you know, getting our kids reading, making a 4K education uh, a priority. Because we've seen the statistics, states that have done this worrying about uh, our children before they get into kindergarten and making sure that they're reading and interacting makes a huge difference in how uh, their success is driven going forward. So that is also a big focus. So the census does impact, it impacts everything. It impacts money that goes to DSS that help our most vulnerable children, which we know we need to take care of here in South Carolina. And it goes to take care of our elders also. So census is so important on so many levels. And I think sometimes we don't think about that. Uh, in the 2010 census, even though we were undercounted, we gained a congressional seat. Uh, Congressman Tom Rice's seat was added in 2010 uh, because of the census. So it is very, very important. So getting the word out uh, is something we all need to do. Well, thank you for that. And I know that uh as all the teachers and parents are learning of kids and homeschooling right now. Um, that's a very important profession. And I think a lot of them are ready for schools to open back up. So uh, I know I've been, see I've been seeing all the funny posts too across social media wanting to know if that you can expel your own kids from the school that you now have in place. <laughs> uh, and I've seen lots of parents that are ready to volunteer for anything a teacher needs, whatever they want. <laughs> Uh, but I, as, as a uh, chairman of the chamber, just want to thank you for taking the time to um, be with us today and hopefully um, 
that this virus doesn't last long and we're able to have you back in Greer in person um, here in the next few months. But uh, thank you for all you're doing and all the Governor McMaster's is doing to keep us all safe. And um, I know y'all make a lot of hard decisions and not everybody likes those, but sometimes <laughs> that's what has to be done and we appreciate that. Well, thank you. I mean, your support and the support of all of our businesses across the state is so important to us. And you're right. These are hard decisions, but know that none of them are being made lightly and they're being done at the advice of, um, of all of the experts based on the data that we have in front of us. So, you know, that's, that's all, that's all we can do is, is do the best we can with what we, with all the information we have. And I feel we're doing a great job doing that. Lieutenant Governor, again, thank you for all that you're doing, your staff is doing, your team is doing to uh, keep us safe. Uh, we will definitely start pushing out the census. I know um, we, we sent a couple uh, reminders recently, but we'll definitely send that out with the importance of filling out that census. And on behalf of the uh, Greater Greer Chamber of Commerce and our Board of Directors, thank you again so much for being part of uh, Greer Chamber Live. Well, thank you so much. It, it, was, it was my pleasure to be here. And if there's anything I can ever do, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or my office. Excellent. Have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, rest of the week. And we'll give a, a virtual uh, uh, clapping uh, applause for <laughs> part of well, this. Well, thank, thank you so much. All right. Have a nice day.